Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. And uh, uh, today um, is the first lecture of uh, uh, the CNPF online school uh, for journalists and media practitioners. Um, as you know, this is uh, an online edition of uh, our, let's say, traditional summer school for journalists and media practitioners uh, uh, that uh, it is usually uh, held here in, in Florence um, uh, during one week in, the, in summertime. But uh, considering uh, the, the situation and considering the pandemic, uh, as you know, uh, this year the school will be in uh, five weeks uh, and it will be online. And uh, considering uh, the main uh, topic of uh, the last uh, months, uh, this year the focus of the school is on uh, media facing the pandemic and uh, so let's uh, call this uh, the, the COVID-19 edition of the school. Uh, why we decided to focus on, uh, on this? Uh, because uh, we uh, realized that uh, uh, the, the journalists are facing uh, many challenges due to the pandemic, uh, due to, to the emergency, due to the, the situation and uh, um, are facing uh, uh, challenges in terms of uh, financial difficulties, uh, constant attacks to the freedom of expression and uh, freedom of the media. And uh, in particular, uh, in, with uh, this first lecture, we would like uh, to explore a bit uh, what are the challenges that uh, uh, journalists and media face in terms of uh, um, obstacles that uh, they, uh, they, they see vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the, the countries, the, the states in which they live in, in, where, in which they um, work. So uh, sometimes uh, uh, the threats to uh, journalism and uh, to media freedom come from the responses of certain states uh, to the emergency. And uh, uh, sometimes also um, some uh, challenges and some, uh, uh, I mean, new uh, um, problems uh, are faced by uh, journalists and uh, users when um, uh, in, when uh, uh, using a, Sorry, because I receive a lot of messages in the meanwhile. Uh, and when uh, using uh, uh, platforms, that uh, online platforms uh, that uh, reacted in their own way to the pandemic, to the disinformation that was spread through the platform themselves on the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So um, we would start uh, to uh, talk about uh, uh, the, the reaction of the states uh, uh, to, to the pandemic and how this impacted uh, media freedom with uh, our uh, distinguished uh, host, uh, home uh, scholar, I mean, the, the, the distinguished um, uh, speaker of today, uh, Cristina Rosgoni, who he is uh, um, a lawyer. Uh, he, he, she works uh, at uh, the Department of Communication of the University of Vienna. She is a te telecommunication and uh, IP uh, legal and policy expert. Uh, she has worked with many uh, international and national organization with national governments, uh, regulators. Uh, she served as uh, a regulator herself, as deputy chairperson of uh, the Telecom Authority in Hungary. And uh, uh, she uh, is an expert in uh, uh, media policy 
and uh, more recently also on uh, regulatory aspects of online platforms uh, uh, and uh, on proposals of uh, regulating uh, um, them also uh, having in mind uh, uh, the, the main topic of uh, this information. Uh, she has a PhD in communication science at the University of Vienna and um, uh, she, a doctor, she has a doctor, she's a doctor juris in law and state uh, sciences and uh, a MA in communication science uh, um, and an MBA at Central European University. Uh, today she will speak, uh, she will provide some insights uh, into uh, the state of press freedom in Europe and uh, on how government uh, uh, respond to, to the pandemic and uh, how this may threaten uh, the, the situation of uh, media freedom in uh, certain given states and in Europe as a whole. So uh, she has uh, more or less 40 minutes to um, introduce uh, her, um, her topic, I mean, to do the, her presentation and then uh, questions will follow. Uh, thank you very much, Christina, for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Edda, and thank you for the invitation. I think um, your school is a wonderful opportunity to get together with practitioners of media journalists, future journalists, and media scholars, and especially, I think, the whole setting up of um, um, the, the school, as you said, the special edition of the school, I think it tells a lot about uh, our everyday experience of uh, um, fighting with the, with the situation of the global health crisis that in my assumption will be more and more, not just um, um, uh, very brief or very short period of time affecting our lives, but uh, probably there will be much more about learnings and takeaways of this uh, uh, period that we are maybe in the middle, maybe at the beginning of. So that's also what we are uh, not sure about and what we don't uh, really know. A warm welcome from me um, from Vienna. It's shiny, sunny, um, a bright, beautiful day here. And, um, and as I see the list of participants, uh, you are basically all over, not just Europe, but also as I can see and, uh, uh, and, and understand, uh, you are located globally. And I really appreciate your interest um, in, uh, in joining us um, today about uh, talking about the, the status of media freedom uh, in a European perspective. I am going to share my screen. Um, and, um, and talk through uh, uh, a few slides and the presentation. And uh, if there are any problems with uh, my audio or, um, or any other ways, please just let me know and um, I can um, uh, try to, to, to fix the problem. Is the screen available and seeable to everyone. Does it work well? Okay, so today I'm going to give you uh, in my presentation a brief overview on the state of play of media freedom in Europe using the example of the COVID pandemic affecting media freedom in various ways and basically affecting all four pillars of media freedom, namely press freedom, media pluralism, independence, and safety. Media freedom has increasingly come under the spotlight in recent years, mostly as a result of growing threats, both in democratic and non-democratic countries there too. 
These threats were often attributed to the rise of populist and authoritarian governments and to many other aspects, actually, uh, mainly economic and technological changes and transformations within the media ecosystem. But these um, um, political um, aspect of uh, this, the growing threats is not to be undermined because these um, attacks on media freedom were increasingly seeing viewing free media as an opponent rather than a fundamental aspect of a free society. The effects of such actions can be grave, particularly given the important role of uh, media freedom and free media playing in upholding democracy and democratic freedoms, as enshrined in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights and in the European Convention on Human Rights. Today, the coronavirus pandemic continues to have significant ramifications for public health, for social welfare, the economy, and the crisis also presents a significant threat to media freedom. And as we will see, governments across the world, the globe, but also in Europe, have seen the pandemic and are increasingly seeing the pandemic as a pretext and as a justification for the implementation of new further restrictions to free expression and, and against media freedom. My aim is uh, to discuss today these systemic and, uh, and uh, um, uh, imminent attacks on media freedom across the four pillars of, uh, of, this, of this freedom using the example of the pandemic as, um, as a, a process that is accelerating such attacks. Also, I will give you very um, um, detailed examples um, on, on, uh, on certain um, um, uh, uh, country uh, aspects using the, um, the example of Hungary in, in the middle of Europe as, uh, as a very critical example in this situation. And my aim is to spark your discussion and to inform your work throughout the five weeks of the school in reflecting upon and uh, reacting to this situation in your corresponding roles as professional journalists and as media scholars. But before we would get to um, the questions of the, uh, the issues on media freedom, I would like to invite you to share your views and your reflections on how you perceive external or internal limitations in your work as journalists or as media scholars working, researching in this area over the course of 22. So I would very much and kindly ask you to use your phones, use your uh, uh, laptops. I'm, I, I'm pretty much sure that most of you are familiar with the Mentimeter concept. And I would kindly ask you to, to go to Mentimeter, use the code that you can see on the screen and share your thoughts. Um, you can share um, um, more of them. Um, at least three of your ideas and, and, um, and um, uh, your perceptions about external and internal limitations in your work that you have either perceived directly during the course of this year or that you have been very concretely been informed about. So please go to Mentimeter and um, If possible, put your answers to this question. And I will refresh the screen so to see 
No, it works. Okay. Go with. <laughs> So please share three of your experiences throughout the year with regards to limitations, either in your own work or in the work of others that you were informed about. Okay, fear of tax smash. Moving, very interesting. Limited movement. Wow. Protective equipment, right. Oh, wow. Moving, a lot of moving and lack of movement. Yes, I think we all get this feeling, lack of access, very importantly. Misinformation. Skepticism, wow. Thank you. More confusion, yeah. Okay. No money. Yes, we will talk about this issue. Fake news, of course. Financial difficulties, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for, uh, for these ideas and uh, for, for sharing these experiences. Um, I really hope that um, all your experiences and all your um, knowledge about the current situation we will be talking about. And uh, please remind me that we are going to come back at the very end of our discussion today to see how much of your personal experiences were met by the, uh, uh, by the uh, data and the information I am going to, to share. Okay, so let me come back to, to the presentation. Um, so first of all, just a few words um, about the, the, the structure of, um, of how we could um, uh, approach the question of media freedom and how we should and could assess um, the question of media freedom. I will use here the approach UNESCO is, um, is using as, uh, as one of the most um, common, most mainstream kind of approach, if you like, about thinking about media uh, freedom, basically looking, looking at the four pillars of that freedom, including the freedom of the press, media freedom, independence of the media, and safety of journalists and of journalism. Media freedom is a core value in Europe and the cornerstone of democracy. However, in, even uh, in the previous year, so in 2019, most of the watchdogs, media freedom watchdogs all around the world have seen media freedom being de deteriorated over basically the past years and over the past decade. In this timeline of the, the past decade, the uh, non-democratic countries, in, in non-democratic countries, in a global perspective, at least one third, one third of the countries were further decreasing in terms of rankings, in terms of uh, media freedom situation. So a further deterioration were reported 
in one third of these countries. And even in democratic settings, so in so-called free countries and democratic countries, one fifth of these countries, so around 20% of these countries over the last decade, and here the emphasis is on the time uh, uh, scale and the time frame, witness deterioration in media freedom. The European Union is not exempt from such tendencies. And decline in free media freedom has occurred also within the European Union in recent years. Here, I think what we should keep in mind is the very uh, latest um, 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 evidence on this deterioration, which was reported in the first rule, rule of law report published by the European Commission at the very end of um, uh, September 2020, at the 30th of September, if I might uh, uh, re uh, recall well, that has highlighted at least five different aspects of um, media freedom deterioration within the European Union, again, with regards to independence of national media regulators, uh, with regards to transparency of ownership in terms of overwhelming misuse of state advertising and distortions of media markets. Another aspect that was highlighted by the report was safety of journalists and the, the questions of access to information. So basically, we could say that over the, the last very important period of a transforming uh, a media system, both globally and in Europe, we should, um, uh, uh, we have seen, and many of us have seen a tendency and, and a systemic way of media freedom deteriorations. So the question is, um, so the question is for our discussion today, how this situation was further impacted, whether further deteriorated by the global uh, public health um, um, crisis, namely the coronavirus pandemic. And I will give you a short um, um, introduction, if you wish about the, um, uh, how this, uh, how this uh, uh, situation, the uh, global health uh, crisis situation was confronted with the systemic weaknesses of media freedom um, and, um, and um, uh, using the um, examples on global restrictions on media freedom due to the um, coronavirus um, uh, uh, situation, using the examples on further restrictions, very often called shock doctrine type of restrictions on, on media freedom, also using references to the disinfodemic, which had an, um, uh, uh, a grave impact undermining public trust in the media, and covering also the economic aspect, aspects of, um, of, uh, uh, of uh, the, um, of the um, uh, effects and uh, the impact of the, the crisis with regards to media independence and media viability. So first, let me give you a few references about the global restrictions on media freedom due to the coronavirus. As I've started my kind of introduction about the last decade, I, I think we should be uh, remember, re reminded that these restrictions did not start in February 2020 or in March 2020, but these restrictions were um, in a systemic way a trend in, in terms of 
um, uh, um, uh, um, affecting and limiting media freedom all across the world and also in Europe. The Reporters Without Borders 2020 report and WordPress Freedom, WordPress freedom Index already warned about entering a decisive decade for journalists exacerbated by the coronavirus at the very beginning of this year. What happened throughout this year um, first and foremost, we don't know how much of this is going to further happen because we don't know in, at which stage we are at of this um, crisis situation. But we do know at this moment from various um, um, uh, reports and from uh, various sources that at least 426 instances of media freedom violations were already reported. And here is a very important uh, aspect that we at least do know about these instances. So these, inst uh, uh, these violations were already recorded by uh, independent uh, watchdogs, such as the International Press Institute in their um, uh, mapping exercise. And I have put on the slide the picture on Europe so that you can see how these several and various um, um, violations were spread across Europe. Meanwhile, protection of journalists and safety of journalists was also at a great risk and the Council of Europe uh, maintain platform for the protection of, uh, of journalists signaled or in this year already five, uh, uh, 145 alerts across 30 countries of Europe. We are not, um, uh, uh, I don't have the, the statistics, possibly the Council of Europe does have about how many of these alerts were directly um, uh, related to, to the pandemic situation, but I think the sheer amount of these alerts is a very important sign for us looking uh, uh, at the, at the, the, uh, um, at the proceedings of this year. And the overall context within Europe is a context whereby the Media Pluralist Monitor um, uh, and a very important uh, uh, source of information you will get uh, more familiar with throughout the five weeks, already signaled in 2020 that three out of five indicators of media freedom and of media pluralism in Europe, within the European Union, were already put at medium or high risk. So these kind of global and European um, restrictions put at risk at least three of the four pillars of media freedom, namely freedom of the press, media pluralism, and safety of journalists. I'm arguing here that these examples show that although media freedom was under serious threat even prior to the emergence of the pandemic. However, the crisis has further exposed systemic weaknesses in a number of countries and implied further crackdowns on media freedom, often under the pretense of a concern for national security in many countries affected uh, by the pandemic. The forms of these um, um, Restrictions and uh, and uh, and crackdowns was very often in um, uh, uh, um, expressed in certain narrative controls, in certain information suppression methods and procedures, and very often in disinformation campaigns by parties, very often also by political actors um, involved in the disinformation and misinformation system. Another aspect 
as I mentioned before, is something that is often re referred to the shock doctrine type of restrictions. So basically restrictions in, uh, in a number of countries, which would be impossible in normal times. These restrictions very often took the form on in, uh, uh, of uh, attacks on journalists. So for example, police intimidation of journalists, political attacks on journalists, and overall and general intimidation of journalists and hindering them in their work, um, covering very often public health stories, public health related information. And these type of restrictions, again, put at least another three aspects of, um, of media freedom at risk, <clears throat> namely pluralism, independence, and safety of journalists and of journalism. The third aspect here um, that is um, very, um, uh, rare, uh, very often referred to as the toxic disemphodemic situation, undermining public trust. This topic will be covered in great details, as I know, um, during week four by the most um, uh, uh, well-known and most experienced expert of this topic, Dr. Claire Wardle. But here in our context, let me also give you uh, some insights and some information, some statistics and evidence on what we are referring to that this infodemic and this toxic situation is uh, of our concern with regards to media freedom. So for example, during this year, uh, a very throughout analysis of more than 112 million public social media posts in 64 different languages across the world that were all related to the pandemic. So this analysis, independent analysis by researchers and scholars found that 40%, 40% of the posts came from unreliable sources. Another, I think, very informative statistics here is about another independent research that was looking into tweets and uh, Twitter feeds over 178 million tweets that were, again, directly related to, to the um, uh, uh, global health situation. And the research found that more than 42% of these um, uh, tweets were produced by bots and over 40% were unreliable of these information pieces. Also, another aspect um, that were uh, looked at by independent uh, researchers and scholars was focusing on the um, experiences of media, social media users, and reported that at least one third of social media users across the world reported seeing false or misleading information about the coronavirus. So these um, um, examples are to, to give you just some ideas about why I'm saying that the volume of this information, the intensity of this information and misinformation, and the combination of this toxic situation. So the combination with so-called emotional content, very often also co uh, a combination with xenophobia, racist and hate speech, ended up in a, in a situation by today that we could say that this, in, in, this infodemic was undermining public trust and public trust in the media very much. 
and putting the pillars of media pluralism and media independence at great risks with regards to media freedom. And my last example here about the economic and financial aspects of media freedom, uh, very much related to media viability and the, uh, um, um, the combined effects of the um, pandemic in this regard led to a situation referred as economic fallout and um, by some scholars, by some researchers called as the media extinction event, whereby some media organizations and, um, and, uh, um, um, and watchdogs already signaled in the middle of 2020 that several media outlets across the world including Europe, seen 70% of declines in revenues, especially in advertising revenues, and that this decline most dramatically affected local and regional media. In the European context, for example, the community radio stations in several countries I have um, data and I have some statistics about the United Kingdom. Um, one third of community radio stations were risking closure already in the middle of this year. So these kind of, um, um, these kind of events and these kind of um, um, instances make us think about the, the moment of the, um, of the pandemic as the media extension event. The, um, the data I have put on the slide is the very first preliminary data I could find for you looking at the combined effects of the global pandemic in a US versus Europe perspective and looking at how this has disproportionately affected European media outlets and who were the very few ones, obviously outside of Europe, who did take some advantage of this situation and could make, although uh, smaller, but still um, profits and positive uh, 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 turnouts throughout the uh, pandemic um, 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 period. Again, here for our concern is that this situation, the, uh, the economic fallout put at least three pillars of media freedom, namely pluralism, independence and safety at greatest risk. And the absence of enough private advertising made several independent media outlets dependent and more dependent on governmental advertising and uh, th um, therefore uh, uh, put them at greatest risk of manipulation uh, on, for political purposes. Just another example here, the case of, uh, of one country within, in the middle of the European Union, namely Hungary. Hungary, my, uh, the country of my birth, became over the last decade, unfortunately, a worst case example within Europe to media freedom deterioration. The effects of the pandemic in this country um, also very directly and straightforwardly illustrate the culminating effects of the current global health crisis and to a situation with an overall vulnerability uh, of the, the media context. 
In Hungary, press freedom was under attack by legal, legal acts, for example, the Authorization Act that was enacted um, um, uh, earlier this year and which was clearly and reportedly not in line with international and European legal standards on freedom of expression and freedom of the media. The other pillar of media freedom independence have seen severe attacks on the very few independent media outlets in the country in forms of 20, 25% cutbacks already by the mid of, middle of this year uh, throughout uh, the different, whether online, offline uh, media outlets in the country. The pluralist pillar have seen severe attacks in forms of, in form of usually pro-government media attacking the credibility of news coverage of critical outlets and questioning the, uh, the reliability and credibility of the news on the health crisis. And the safety of journalists was also put uh, under, um, uh, uh, under attack. And journalists were very often intimidated, especially by political figures, as scaremongers of the society. So my point is, and my argument, main argument here is about that what we have seen is a complexity and convergence of systemic crisis situations in forms of democratic crisis due to polarization and repressive policies in form of an economic crisis and the impoverishment of quality journalism in form of a technological crisis due to a lack of democratic guarantees with regards to regulating, for example, online platforms who had a huge and great role in the disinfodemic situation, and also in form of the crisis of trust due to um, suspicion and, uh, and very often direct hatred attacks on free media. And this systemic um, and converging crisis situation was compounded by the global public health crisis and accelerated the effect thereof. So my argument is that right now we see a downwarding and perpetual spiral, which has grave societal impacts. And this is the spiral we have to stop. And what I'm also arguing is that while the media used to be the part of the solution of such crisis situations, like a global pandemic, especially in democratic settings, right now what we can see that the media is also part of the problem. So basically, these are the main arguments I wish to put forward for, uh, for our discussion today and especially for your discussion uh, throughout the five weeks. And I would very much appreciate your feedbacks, your questions, and especially uh, looking back to your first reactions, part of your um, personal experiences, part of your professional experiences, I would very much um, uh, appreciate whether you see your experiences in this bigger picture of the systemic crisis I have tried to provide you with. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Christina. Uh, I think that uh, your conclusions uh, somehow match what uh, we, we found also during our 
monitoring. I mean, the, the last uh, round of uh, uh, the media pluralist monitor uh, somehow highlights this crisis of uh, the, the media system. And of course, uh, as you said, the, the coronavirus accelerated somehow what was already uh, in, uh, in the reality of, of uh, things. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, um, I would start then to, I would open the floor for uh, the, the questions. I kindly ask Luke to convert the, since we are uh, 26 that's, that's participants. Done. Okay. Yep. So I think that uh, it's less, uh, it, it's a better feeling, I mean, to, to have, uh, to see at least uh, some faces, uh, considering that uh, this is uh, an online uh, uh, seminar, it is a little bit cold otherwise. Uh, um, so I would like to open the floor and uh, there are questions. I think that Luke has... Uh, can I? Can I? Uh, okay. Tanya. Can I ask? Uh, it's actually uh, uh, the uh, relationship between an online yeah, we platform. cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Oh, sorry. No. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Uh, it's actually related to connections between media and social media platforms. So my feeling in this too is actually quite, uh, it became even wider during COVID. Uh, meaning that basically a uh, majority of people actually relied on, on social media platforms and on digital media for the information it actually brought somehow uh, more more than ever power uh, of social media to, to somehow lead the public debate. So and, and some to uh, to distinguish what's uh, what's the um, information, what is information, and somehow took over that role from the traditional media. So I was wondering if you can do you share any mistaking somehow in 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 my uh, think, thinking. Uh, and also, I can say that I can relate very much to, to the Hungarian experience. Unfortunately, uh, the way Serbian system is working now is actually looking very much into Hungarian model and very much copying the, the, the Hungarian model. So I can very much relate to what you just described. And, and thank you for, very much for, for, for this insight. Thank you so much, Tanya, uh, for the for the questions. Um, um, I don't know, Elda. Can I answer right now? Can I? Uh, okay. 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 And may, um, let's see. Um, but these are, I think, two very distinct and very important reflections. So, first of all, the the social media and the platforms aspect. Um, I did not go into details because I think uh, you really ha uh, will have the the um, uh, uh, unique opportunity to discuss this question uh, with um, uh, with Dr. Wadl uh, throughout uh, week four. But right now, let me give you my view on this. So. We see several attempts on national level and also on international level to make social media platforms, video sharing platforms, um, online intermediaries. There are an abundance of definitions how you see these actors reliable and to a certain extent, extent responsible for content shared on their platforms and how they go on with this content. Just uh, um, uh, focusing on the European context and especially the European Union's context, 2016 was the first moment when the code of conduct was, um, was accepted um, uh, with regards to hate speech. 
that was um, that was uh, hailed as uh, an effective uh, self-regulatory um, uh, measure with regards to controlling the power of um, of um, of the uh, of these intermediaries of the platforms. This code had, let's put it this way, some effect, but a very contested and very uh, debated um, effect in terms of no one knows at this moment what is really happening in terms of who is deleting what and for what reasons. And, um, and um, it's also questionable whether the adherence to this code was actually, we could even talk about self-regulation rather than something that is called solo regulation. So basically, Twitter or Facebook deciding how and in what sense they are going to implement um, uh, their own rules and the, 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 the um, uh, aspects of the code. And there is absolutely no meaningful public oversight and public interest driven oversight on what is going on with regards to hate speech. The, the second attempt in this uh, trend was the 2019 code um, on the uh, code of practice with regards to um, elections and the European parliamentary elections. There, the first, again, I would say attempt was made to get some more reliable public oversight and public scrutiny about how and why and, and to what extent platforms were adhering to the code and what happened. This oversight uh, by, the, uh, by the European national media regulators concluded that they did not have enough power and they did not have the enough resources to meaningfully oversee this kind of power uh, of, the, of the platforms. Um, um, and how much this has influenced the elections. Right now, what is going on all across the European Union, uh, 27 member states, but also uh, uh, adopted by the UK, is the implementation of the AVMSD directive and to see how and to, to, to what extent uh, um, uh, video sharing platforms and social media platforms are coming under regulation in, in a very limited area of so-called audiovisual media regulation. And let's see how this is going to, to com counter and balance this kind of power of the platforms. But I would also argue that um, many scholars, many independent uh, uh, researchers already raise their voice about much more severe and much more um, systemic ways of the need for regulating platforms and the so-called opinion power they have as political act, uh, actors in their own rights. This is an aspect I very much suggest you to come back week, throughout week four and get into to details uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Claire Vardel um, on, on, on her views. With regards to Serbia, thank you for uh, mentioning the situation in Serbia. I've had the, the, the opportunity and the privilege to, to work more than three years in Serbia on several aspects of media freedom. And I can very much share your frustration and very much feel your frustration about how Serbia was taking over and learning from the Hungarian experiences um, um, deteriorating media freedom, um, even within the European Union's context. So thank you so much for mentioning this example. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, well, in case I, I have uh, a, a question, um, when uh, you spoke about uh, the Hungarian case, uh, you mentioned uh, the Authorization Act and uh, the law against scam, against scam mongering. Uh, could you please uh, detail a bit uh, uh, how this law was implemented and uh, what are, uh, how it, is it, uh, it is limiting uh, freedom of expression? 
Thank you for the question. So this um, lower um, uh, the uh, the authorization act was enacted um, in the very beginning of the of the um, 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 uh, outbreak of the pandemic in Hungary, and. Um, and there is a very detailed legal uh, opinion. Uh, I, I think I also put on the slide uh, the, the source there too, so you can look up the details. So the Authorization Act was enacted in, term, in, uh, in order to, um, to limit um, public discourse, public information, and also um, in several ways, access to public information. The law was um, um, uh, restricted to the um, state of emergency period, which is right now not in place anymore in Hungary. So right now the act is not effective because the state of emergency is, was not recalled again. We don't know, no one knows, uh, probably the government knows whether they wish to call um, uh, again, um, um, uh, declare again the state of emergency. The way the act was limiting um, um, media freedom was basically with very vague legal terms about what disinformation and what misinformation um, uh, would have been like. It was threatening journalists and media professionals who were reporting about for example, controversial um, uh, information that contradicting information uh, that was contradictory to the government's published numbers information on the situation, the healthcare situation, or the numbers of the of the cases, for example, very typical aspect. And journalists who were about to uh, to report, they were threatened becoming scaremongers. And because the legal terms were vague and did not meet the requirements of the rule of the law, many news outlets and many journalists um, uh, experienced chilling, so-called chilling effects and were really, really uh, constrained in their work because there were no legal certainty whether a certain news reporting would be seen by the, the police, by the state persecutors as a case of scaremongering. And this was a very uh, worrying situation in a country where the only common uh, shared um, experience of many was that the information, the public authorities and the government were um, uh, publishing were not up to date, were not um, uh, reliable, and everyone was looking for other sources of reliable information in, in this sense or from independent uh, uh, news media sources. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? Look. Uh, I just saw there's a there's a question from Anna in the chat uh, about Ukraine. Um, tracing and tracking apps. Um, yes, thank you, Anna, for the for the question. Um, the tracing and tracking apps. Yes, that is um, that is um, 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 a question that is still, I think, um, um, I would say in the spotlight in many countries. Um, um, it's in the crossroads, the, uh, the, the critiques and the, um, um, and the uh, um, complaints about the, the tracking uh, apps, the use of tracking apps. So it's, uh, it's in the crossroads of data protection and privacy um, legal matters. And also on the other hand, um, uh, public health, and in some ways, and, and in to, to some extent, also um, uh, freedom of expression questions. Um, I don't have a clear overview how many countries in Europe were about to uh, introduce these, the use of these apps. Um, I think basically all countries um, offered 
the use of these apps. And the, the critical aspect was whether they were about to make the use of these apps mandatory or it was a complementary and, um, and opt-in type of um, measure that was free to be decided by, by the citizens of the, of the country. The country I am based in, Austria, and also seen huge debates on, on, uh, on the use of, um, of these um, uh, tracking apps, because the, <clears throat> the very first ideas of the, the government also here in Austria was about to make the use of these apps as, a, as a mandatory, which was harshly, <coughs> sorry, criticized by uh, human rights defenders and by um, data protection and privacy uh, protection specialists. So right now there is an app, for example, here in Austria in place, but the use thereof is not mandatory. Other questions? Tatiana, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is more about how did um, it has to do with re restrictions on the work of journalists in, uh, namely in, in not only Hungary but in other countries you may be familiar of. And I was wondering how how was the reporting of um, EU policies affected by the COVID crisis? Uh, for example, you had. Um, online council meetings or more frequent meetings of health ministers and this uh, famous July council meeting that lasted for like four days and ended up with the, well, with the proposal of the modified proposal of the commission. And I was wondering how it was covered in general in the countries you are more familiar uh, with, Hungary or Austria, but feel free to uh, mention other cases. And if there were restrictions to the work of journalists in terms of accreditation or um, giving access to press conference after council meetings in, uh, in not only, but in particular in these four days of the council, but in general, since January, since the COVID uh, outbreak. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, <clears throat> I would be also very much interested in um, the experiences of journalists who, who try to access, for example, the, um, the uh, council meetings. So my experience and my um, uh, uh, information about this situation in several countries, several countries, journalists were um, obstructed in, uh, in, in taking part um, at um, uh, press conferences physically, but also online. In many cases, uh, the, um, the absurd manner was uh, was used that journalists had to send ahead the questions to the press officers of the government. And uh, when the um, <clears throat> press uh, conferences took place, then the journalist questions were basically interpreted in a way, in a usually much softer way than they were posed to, uh, to, to the speakers of these conferences. So basically, um, journalists had no way to directly ask and, uh, uh, and confront, for, for example, politicians with the statements, with the official numbers, with contradictory information. So, so this, uh, this happened in, in, in several countries. The other question about um, uh, reporting on, on European policies, uh, I think that's a huge and, and, and extremely uh, interesting um, um, question and I'm pretty sure there will be a lot of research and a lot of uh, independent analysis coming uh, um, um, in the, the, the coming uh, 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 in the upcoming period. Here my experience is that um, um, I have uh, made some really small scale, let's put it this way, research with my students during the summer on the framing of, um, of, uh, of the, the European policy uh, uh, reporting in different uh, news outlets, uh, first and foremost, uh, within Austria, uh, because uh, uh, we were working on 
um, one of the research classes throughout the, the summer semester. And the biggest um, finding or the most interesting finding was about the lack of solidarity. And the lack of solidarity um, in a comparative um, uh, uh, manner. So for example, we were looking at international press, local press and national um, and, and mainstream outlets. And um, if you might remember, there were, um, there were incidents, I think it was in May, when some countries, for example, Germany offered to take uh, from Italy uh, sick people to treat them in, in their hospitals. And, um, and there, this was also kind of um, an example when the, the question how much it would mean right now in the middle of such situation to look at Europe as a union based on solidarity, based on shared values, based on shared uh, beliefs. Um, on the other hand, the media very often framed these kind of reportings as, uh, as, uh, um, as the um, lack of support, the, um, the complaints against the European Commission, the European Union as such. So, so I would say that from my perspective, the most interesting part of, uh, of media coverage was, was the, the, the question of, um, of how to present Europe as a, as a union or as, um, as a place where the, the lack of solidarity prevailed. Thank you. Uh, Adrian, Adriana Mutu has a hand up. Yes, hello. Thank you, Krishna, for your presentation. Um, in the, you have mentioned uh, the implementation of the audiovisual media services directive a little bit uh, so pre previously in your uh, answers. And I was wondering if you have any insights or what is the current uh, state of the art of the transposition of the directive into the national legislation across all the European member states. And I'm particularly interested in finding or knowing more uh, about uh, some of the initiatives taken by the national media regulatory authorities in relation to the online intermediaries, maybe in relation to the, I don't know, the protection of minors or protecting uh, media independence um, in general. So the initiatives and the actions taken by national uh, media authorities. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> I think we've been in correspondence before. So. Yes, um, first of all, so um, the deadline for the transposition was the 19th of September, which um, uh, very, very few countries in Europe have met, and which was, uh, I think, also officially postponed because of, of the, the pandemic. The most up-to-date um, uh, um, information on the national transposition process was published a few weeks ago uh, beginning of October, as, my, as I remember, or maybe very late September, by the European Audiovisual Observatory, going into also the details. I'm very happy to, to send you the link, uh, but, but maybe you can uh, easily also find it. So going into the topics, um, also with regards to the new regulations, uh, with regards to video sharing platforms, the um, um, the advertising rules, um, the quota rules, you know, the different chapters and, and looking into the uh, national legislations. Um, I was going through and going into details um, uh, of, this, uh, of this update. Um, the picture is really scattered. Let me put, uh, uh, let me give you my um, uh, interpretation. The biggest question mark is Ireland. And uh, because of the country of origin principle, and because of the fact that basically all major video sharing platforms are all registered with Ireland, in Ireland, uh, incorporated in Ireland. So basically the big question right now is what is going to happen uh, about the implementation and the transposition in Ireland, where um, the, uh, um, the government proposed end of 2019, a new, uh, uh, already, sorry, already beginning of 2020, a new bill to implement 
which would also implement the ABMSD with regards to online platforms in a bigger attempt of regulating online platforms and, uh, and, and online intermediaries. Right now, the bill is still pending um, uh, because of the political changes uh, in, in Ireland. So right now, it's not clear how this is going to be um, uh, um, enacted. Also, this bill was proposing a new regulator to put in place, um, a much bigger, more powerful regulator, basically a converged regulator in, a, in a, um, I think the new name will be the Media Commission instead of the, the BA. I, um, the, 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 the uh, Broadcast uh, uh, Authority of Ireland right now. So this media commission is, uh, should take over the regulatory task from the, um, from the current regulator. Um, so the, the, the focus right now should be on, on the Irish procedures. This is my kind of suggestion here. And some warnings also. If you look at um, what happened after the, the um, entering into force of the GDPR and how the Irish regulator in that area, like data protection area, was actually not meaningfully enforcing the GDPR. I think, um, um, and there's a lot of information data about that. Um, um, and, and the very recent uh, case uh, of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So I think that's a kind of a warning signal that, um, that Ireland should be put under um, high level of public scrutiny and scholarly scrutiny in that sense. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.